Welcome to the second day of the 1997 annual meeting and conference for the Georgia Coalition on Family Violence. For those of you that were here yesterday, thank you for coming again. For those of you that have come just for today, we're very excited to have such an exciting and, and uh, informative program. Um, for me, this is almost like a dream come true. In a few hours, I'm going to go pick up Gloria Steinem and bring her to Valdosta to uh, present to us something we haven't had probably ever before. I'm very excited, and I'm also excited to have my 16-year-old daughter here who can experience it with me. Uh, I want to welcome you all again to this program. Where our lunch is full. We have completely booked the lunch. If you haven't registered, sorry. <laughs> it's too late. Um, the, uh, the entire proceeds from the luncheon will go to support the Georgia Coalition on Family Violence. It's the only fundraiser that we will do this year. So we appreciate all of your support. The coalition supports each of the shelter programs in such a huge way and has grown so much. Uh, that we're very excited to have this opportunity to give it a chance to grow even more this year. I'm going to turn this immediately over to Dr. Vicki Sodi, who's going to introduce our morning workshops, and I'm going to let this day get started and enjoy the ride. I hope that all of our guests are enjoying their stay in Valdosta. You got a little bit of rain yesterday, which is fairly unusual for us, although we've been in a, a pattern of that lately. This morning's program features, first of all, a discussion of the feminist movement and domestic violence. Uh, we hope, my colleagues and I, that when the morning concludes, you will know some things about feminism uh, that perhaps you've not heard before. We all know the frightening nature of the F word, uh, even for people who in their daily behaviors uh, manifest all the symptoms um, of being a part of that spreading disease. And what we would like to do is try to take the disease out of it. And all of my colleagues have given me the permission to say that they will own the F word. We are all feminists. And maybe we won't turn out to be as frightening as we're sometimes described. The first panel, the second, first one is on the feminist movement and domestic violence. There will be two speakers and then plenty of time for your questions and interactions. Uh, my colleagues and I, feminists, want to know what you think. Gloria Steinem also wants to know what you think. What we think is just theory. What you think reflects the activism and what is truly going on in the community, what the true needs of women and children are. So we're going to leave ample time, and you will get the last word on both of these panels. The second panel is a retrospective on Gloria Steinem's life and work. Um, we all know a little bit about her, but I must confess, in the last two weeks, I've learned a great deal more than I knew before. And when she actually comes, we'll see how accurate we were uh, in our descriptions of her. And it will also make you experts so that you will feel easier in, in your discussions with her, because she also will want you to have the last word. I'd like to introduce my first two uh, colleagues for the first panel. Kathy Badura, who has come to us this year. In fact, for every member of these uh, panels this morning, there is a unique celebration. And I will be telling you what this year's celebration is. In the case of Kathy, it's our celebration, especially mine. Uh, she is a real living feminist historian, the first one hired by Valdosta State for that purpose. And I am so thrilled to have her here. She is a wonderful colleague. We are all thrilled to have her here. And her PhD is from Michigan State University. After Dr. Badura, uh, Dr. Ginger Macheski will be speaking. Uh, Ginger has been a professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice for a number of years. And she is, of course, well known in the community for her work. But the celebration in her regard is that she just obtained the rank of full professor, something that all women regard with pride and a great deal of celebration when it occurs. So without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Kathy Badura. I 
forgot to title my paper. I guess it's, I'm, I'm talking about um, a particular. Uh, A particular debate um, among feminists, and I hope to sort of shed some light on that, and also to talk about the history of domestic violence. How's that? How's that? Is that better? No? How about now? Is that okay? Is that better? Then I'll yell, but I'll need my water. <laughs> I'm talking about the difference debate um, in uh, the, among feminists today, um, as well as a little bit about the history of domestic violence. Um, awareness of domestic violence is not a recent development. For some time, informed people have been aware that domestic violence was more of a threat to social stability than was the decline of family values. Can, can you hear me? Is that, is that better? Okay. 19th century philosopher John Stuart Mill is a noted example. Mill questioned the prevailing myth that the nuclear family dwelling or what one historian of domestic violence has called the family ideal was beyond the reach of the law. Mill claimed, on the contrary, that protection of individual family members was one of the chief obligations of government. The domestic life of domestic tyrants, Mill wrote in 1848, is one of the things which it is the most imperative on the law to interfere with. But if Mill was aware in 1848 of the dangers of domestic violence, he was part of a very small minority. Surely, if there had been more widespread and sustained public awareness in 1848, by 1997, we would not still be waging an uphill battle to end it. My role today as historian is to say a few things about the history of domestic violence and community response as well as to say a few things about the history of the feminist movement over the past century and a half. It is no coincidence that historically public awareness of domestic violence and the emergence or re-emergence of a strong feminist movement have been parallel developments. And conversely, when feminism declines in strength, so does public concern over de victims of domestic violence. As goes feminism, so goes public support to end the battering and abusing of women and children. With that historical lesson in mind, we can look at the feminist movement for its role as a powerful catalyst for social justice. It is no secret, however, that feminists are not all of one mind, that they come in all political stripes. The labels distinguishing feminists vary according to who is doing the labeling. Over the past, there have been natural rights feminist, social feminist, uh, feminist new style, classical liberal feminist, a radical feminist, Marxist feminist, socialist feminist, womanist feminist, and the list could go on. And each of us in this room might have our own categories. But when I think of where this could lead or how distracting it could become to identify every category of feminist, I recall one of my favorite lines from Gloria Steinem. From a story she tells about a friend who says she was married to one Marxist and one fascist and neither one of them took out the garbage. <laughs> That unarguably speaks volumes for an experience many of us here today can appreciate, if only vicariously. It also leads me to the primary issue I want to address, namely the debate among feminists over equality versus difference, a debate is, that is perhaps the liveliest and most enduring the movement has known, for it spans this entire century. I hope to clarify the terms of the debate examine its historical roots, bring a, and bring us to some of the sources of its recent controversy. Briefly, the debate centers on the question of how to treat the obvious differences between women and men, what, whether one regards those differences as sociological or biological, what do we do with them? Do women celebrate their differences from men? Do we pretend they do not exist? 
Do we attempt to transcend them? Do we attempt to escape them? Do we challenge them? The decision either way has significant consequences, not the least of which is that it affects the political strategy feminists assume in our struggle for social justice. But the, de the decision is not a simple or straightforward one, as both recent and more distant history have proven. Some women, even those, for instance, who quote, know all the facts, know intellectually or believe with their heads, so to speak, that they should think one way, but feel in their heart something quite different. One activist and scholar who was a late 60s founding member of the New York radical feminist said that in the late 90s, she still struggles with the issue. She used to be loath to concede any differences between the sexes, felt uneasy about the maternal rhetoric and the talk of sisterhood that surrounded the movement, came to find the differences among women too numerous to collapse into one category called woman. Yet, she had to admit that whatever the issue, feminists have gained a great deal by saying, we are women and this is what women want. This belief in some ground of shared experience is the social basis from which any sustained political struggle must come. We cannot ignore, however, that the debate among feminists over how to treat differences is and has been from the beginning a conundrum. When we ignore the differences or downplay them in an effort to achieve equal rights, we are penalized by the strict letter of the law and legal equality becomes simply a guise for economic and social inequality. When we accept the differences, whether it is to embrace them, celebrate them, or merely to concede them, either way, we are betrayed by the letter of the law. We become a special interest group and thereby unavoidably marginalized. The reasons, some feminist historians explain, can be found in the inherent limitations in Western thinking, a murky subject at best. The Western mind can think, they maintain, um, only in binary or polar opposites, good versus bad, right versus wrong, white versus black, men versus women, etc. In other words, only in hierarchies. Therefore, differences are unavoidably ranked. Different is unavoidably less than. Within this mo because the standard of measure, the norm, is unavoidably male. Within this model, men are not different from women. Women are different from men. That may sound absurd to the newcomer, but eventually to most women, it makes plenty of sense. In any event, um, it helps to trace the historical roots of this dilemma. Before examining the debate more closely, however, I want to mention three historic cases of domestic violence, not for anything that sets them apart, but rather to note and reflect for a moment on the community's response in each case. Even though two of them occur in the relatively distant past, community response is not demonstrably different from what it might be today. The implications of that observation I hope to make clear. First, in a small town in the state of Maine in 1806, James Purrington, apparently distressed over his family's financial future, murdered his wife and five of his six children with an ax and a knife, he dreadfully butchered them, recorded the editor of the local newspaper. Later in the century, in 1856, in predominantly rural Union County, North Carolina, an intoxicated Alvin Pressler, quote, struck, choked, and kicked his wife brutally until she fled on foot with her two children to her father's house, but died from her injuries en route. And finally, in a small mill village here in Georgia, names and place to remain anonymous, in the middle of this century, mill worker John Doe murdered his wife after arguing with her over the whereabouts of his car keys, which were later found in his coat pocket. When he asked her where the keys were, he accused her of lying when she, didn't know, when she said she didn't know. The ensuing argument drew a crowd from the surrounding village. 
Mrs. Doe fled the house with neighbors looking on. Mr. Doe chased her down, dragged her back to their home by her hair, and with residents of the mill village outside in earshot, Doe beat his wife to death with a ball peen hammer, sexually molested her dead body, and threw the remains on the porch while villagers looked on. There is nothing especially unique about either of these cases. Horrifically, similar incidences have been played out countless times throughout our country's history. The response of the communities in these three cases, however, is what is instructive because of the way they represent the strength and the resilience of what I referred to earlier as the family ideal or, as defined by a feminist historian, a concept within traditional family structure that, among other things, privileges or gives legitimacy to privacy within the nuclear family over the well-being and physical safety of vulnerable members within. Community response is important because it reveals beliefs that people call on to explain things that seem painfully inexplicable to make sense out of things that so shamelessly defy a community's ideals, that seemingly undermine what they value most in life, which for many people across numerous cultural divides is family. In the main case cited, the local newspaper editor speculated, as we are all inclined to do in cases where eyewitnesses are not available, but this editor speculated about the probable unfolding of events surrounding the gruesome murders. Interestingly, in his reconstructed account, the older daughter and mother are the responsible ones for the family slaughter. If only they had hidden their distress when they found the head of the household writing a suicide note, the murders might have been avoided. According to this editor, the crimes, though heinous, were understandable. Purrington, in his role as patriarch or loving husband and father, by murdering his family, was sparing them the grief, stigma, and other inevitable consequences of his death. In the North Carolina murder case cited, the reaction of the community again reveals the strength of the family ideal. After the judge convicted Alvin Pressler of murdering his wife and the judge sentenced him to hang, approximately 300 representatives of the community, some of whom were women, quickly drafted a petition to the governor to commute the death sentence for two mitigating reasons. One, Pressler, quote, had not intended to kill his wife, but had beaten her as the result of a drunken frolic. And two, and perhaps more telling, Mrs. Pressler had to take some responsibility for her own death since when she fled the house, it was raining and she knew she'd been suffering with chills and a cold over the past week. Obviously, it was easier for the community to blame the victim's bad judgment or the weather or the alcohol or anything to lessen the degree of guilt of the husband for the consequences of his actions. To blame the husband was to strike at the heart of the family ideal or the very structure of society, which for all but the most radical throughout history has been an unthinkable alternative. Finally, in the Georgia incident, the community's response reflects the strength of the family ideal, ideal again in two ways. First, whatever were the thoughts of those who watched or listened as John Doe beat his wife to death with a hammer. However horrified some of them must have been, not one was willing to cross the sacred boundary of the family ideal or the privacy of the household and the absolute authority of the man who headed it. And two, the strength of the ideal is revealed in the lapse in community memory or the ease with which the community forgets the victim and forgives the crime of domestic violence. John Doe was rehired by the mill after serving his jail term for wantonly killing his wife before numerous witnesses. The point from these three historic cases is, until we as feminists are able to expose the fallacies sustaining the patriarchal family ideal, 
the genuine strength of family ties as an ideal venue for human fulfillment and social stability will remain just out of reach. And so I turn to the feminist movement and its strength as a venue for social change and the realization of social justice, and back to the equality versus difference debate that has divided feminists ideologically for the past century. There were several key issues that took shape and key events that unfolded to bring about the division. The issues actually began with the introduction of woman suffrage in 1848, and the identifiable events began with the, introduction, with the introduction of protective legislation in 1908. Protective legislation was laws designed originally to accommodate women and children in the industrial workforce. The premise or the basis behind women's claim to voting rights and the claims upon which protective legislation were based is what is significant. The original premise upon which the early suffragists are those women who started the women's rights movement in the middle of the 19th century. The original premise upon which they sought the vote is the same principle upon which we have been told our foremothers and fathers fought the American Revolution the same premise that guided Thomas Jefferson when he penned the Declaration of Independence, i.e., people have a natural right to freedom, a necessary part of which is political uh, liberty. For the early suffragists, equality of women and men was as much a self-evident truth, as much an inalienable right, as was the Lockean right claimed by our foremothers and fathers who rebelled against Great Britain. Hence, political rights for women were not merely something men owed them uh, because it was something they had gained, but because political rights were human rights, natural rights. For the early suffragists, differences between the sexes would not be an issue once women gained the vote, gained property rights, and gained rights, uh, legal rights to their children, neither of which a married woman had. Enough legal remedies would eventually eliminate the sexual double standard, they believed. For a variety of reasons, none of which are admirable because they were informed mostly by racism, elitism, and ethnocentrism, but for what we could at best term political expedience, the premise of some of the early suffragists' claim to the vote changed from the vote being a natural right to the vote being a deserved right. Certain women deserved the vote, they would claim, because they were educated and refined, or translated, white and middle class. So the premise went from political rights based on natural rights theory to political rights based on merit. But the bottom line is, in both cases was a belief by these suffragists in the equality of women and men a belief that the differences between the sexes basically should be ignored, at least as far as the law and political rights were concerned. As far as private and personal life was concerned, one finds in their writings a distinct belief that the differences between the sexes were conditions or states of mind, so to speak, that could be either transcended or escaped, depending upon one's inner resources and psychic savvy. But this belief, this premise, the conviction that women and men were equal and hence equally deserving of political rights is not what won the vote. Not only did the political strategy of suffragists change after their reunion in 1890, so did the entire approach to the issue of why women should be able to vote for a variety of complex reasons that fill the progressive era in this country. Women were able to gain the vote only when they quit campaigning for it based on their equality with men and began to demand it based upon their superiority to men, their moral superiority, that is. Women, the argument went, should be given the vote for two good and socially acceptable reasons. As morally superior agents, their vote would clean up corrupt government. And in the second place, as natural pacifists, they, there are, they would argue their vote would eventually put an end to war. <clears throat> Dream on. 
The latter argument became infinitely more attractive, however, as the country um, entered World War I. What is important here is the stark difference between the beliefs of the early suffragists um, in the equality of the sexes and those of the later suffragists on the differences between the sexes. Interestingly, the latter's beliefs were far less threatening to the social structure, which in no, in, no doubt in part explains suffragists' final success. But if the issue of sexual difference unwittingly takes shape around suffrage, it consciously begins to divide feminist around the issue of protective legislation, or again, laws that were designed to take into consideration the special needs of women and children. Those who supported protective legislation would argue that it protected women, and that was good. Those who opposed it would argue that it limited women, which was not good. In any event, the history of protective legislation formally began in 1908 with the Supreme Court case of Mueller versus Oregon, and it did not end until the 1970s, and then only in spurts and gasps, one historian writes. The premise behind protective legislation was in the beginning and remained a belief that in a market economy where the profit motive governs, Women need special protection. That was in the past. The division among feminists over protective legislation today is considerably more difficult to reduce to a few statements because it is so multi-layered in its complexities. It is an issue that crosses many political divides, but the basic question comes back to, what do we do with the differences between the sexes? The interpretation of protective legislation and the suggestion in the past decade of a need for a return to it are both controversial and complex, to say the least. But the issue forms the very heart of the equality versus difference debate. Some argue that a return to protective legislation would do more harm than good, that it would circumscribe and limit opportunities for women, that it is anachronistic, out of date, out of place, certainly in the 1990s. Others argue, however, without a degree of special treatment, equal treatment can yield unequal results and that strict equality with no room for difference holds <coughs> hidden disadvantages. The dilemma becomes what degree of special treatment is needed? How much is enough without ghettoizing women as a special interest group? When does equal treatment equal equality, and when does it become unequal results? And again, what do we do with our differences? Without engaging that particular controversy any further, there are, after all, no quick fixes. <coughs> I want to close by mentioning some proposed alternatives. They are interesting in that they offer simultaneously both hope and discouragement. It seems that when it's over, the 20th century for feminists will have been the proverbial catch-22. In any event, the studies offer hope that the conundrum is not beyond resolution, that the question of what we do with our differences will at some point be a relic of the past instead of something that haunts the ever-present. Unfortunately, however, conclusions of the studies are also a bit discouraging because the nature of the resolution is so slow in its process, a process which, though not revolutionary, is nonetheless evolutionary and hence takes time. Most of the studies that propose what I'm claiming as viable alternatives have responded to the notion introduced in the 1980s that women though not exclusively women, but primarily women, are socialized to speak and to hear in a different voice, a different moral voice, that is, a voice that does not separate the body from the mind, one that does not privilege knowledge learned through the intellect over knowledge learned through the other senses, a voice that privileges context or the concrete situation, the here and now over the abstract ideal, a voice that prefers connection with others over detachment from others, a voice that values relationships over rules, 
a voice that believes care is not antithetical to justice and respect. The theory of the different voice, however, is at odds with the existing moral theory, the one shaped by the Enlightenment. Theorists argue over how fundamental are the odds that separate the two moral systems, but no one argues that the chief dilemma in any kind of change is the formidable strength of the existing theory, a hierarchical way of thinking that has been in place for several centuries and that has, some would argue, fully established the Western world through its innate military, political, and cultural colonialism. How does one displace such a dominant system? For the past decade or more, feminists have been suggesting alternative ways. One that has received a lot of attention across disciplines, one that is based on being able to speak and hear in a different voice, is an ethic of care an ethic that places a higher priority on human relationships than on abstract rules, a higher priority on the ability to connect with others through compassion and concern than the ability to de detach oneself from others for the purpose of attaining some universal form of justice. Not everyone believes in the viability of an ethic of care, not even all feminists. Critics say it is a romantic notion, one that sounds good at best, but realistically is unfeasible. Others, however, are working to validate the notion, to prove it not only a realistic alternative, but perhaps the most viable one, especially considering that the other alternative is to remain with what we have now, a moral system which is morally bankrupt one that has proven its capacity to tolerate and ignore the worst sorts of social injustice, hunger, homelessness, and poverty in the midst of plenty, sickness in the midst of the most advanced health care. Finally, it is a moral system that has proven its capacity to perpetuate insidiously dangerous ideals, like the family ideal that promotes an abstract model of family that undermines everyone's lived reality a model that teaches victims to internalize the shame of domestic abuse and the rest of society to treat it as a personal problem. This is a model that has spent itself. As feminists, we are charged with seeing that the model has met its match. It is up to feminist moral philosophers to make viable the alternative ethic. It is up to the rest of us as feminists in all walks of life Feminist lawmakers, law enforcers, law interpreters, feminist teachers, feminist clergy, feminist professional caregivers, feminist activists, all of us to see that the ethic is implemented. Only then will domestic violence be a subject no longer for activists, but one for historians to reflect on and ponder as an unfortunate phenomenon in our country's past. Thank you. Hello. Welcome to Valdosta. As you've heard, Kathy and I have something in common. We both went to Michigan State for graduate school. She was in history and I was in sociology. When we were there, we learned a lot. For example, um, we both learned enough to move south to avoid the uh, cold winters and icy roads. We also had the benefit of living in a community that was, had a rich and full feminist tradition, East Lansing, Michigan. It wasn't until I reached Valdosta, and I came about 10 years ago this fall, that I learned feminism was a dirty word, the F word. I heard different variations from my students, from people in the community, from my colleagues about feminism. Feminism was a biased perspective that feminists were man-hating, or sexually suspect, or worse yet, baby killers. I hear similar things today. To admit you're a feminist in this community is to admit to a perversion. We've admitted 
those of us on this panel, I'd, I'd like to ask you, how many of you are feminists? That's great, that's great. You know, it's not that people don't accept feminist move, the gains of the feminist movement. You don't hear, I don't hear from my students that women should be paid less than men. I don't hear that it's okay for men to beat their wives or that an education is wasted on women. I don't hear any of those things. But few people recognize those as gains of the feminist movement. In other words, people accept the product, the message, but not the vehicle. Feminism is discredited. Feminism, the F word. I say it's time to speak out to reclaim the movement, to reclaim feminism and the accomplishments of feminists from the conservative detractors, to say the F word as often as we need to. Feminism has been a powerful force. Feminism has been a positive force. And feminism has been a productive force in shaping the lives and the experience of women of the 90s. The jobs we have, the education we receive, the legal, the legal protections we enjoy, even the medical treatments available to us have been enriched by the feminist movement. In no place can the contribution of feminism be more clearly seen than in the shelter movement, which began as the battered women's movement in the early 1970s. Feminist and feminist ideals were central to every facet of work against domestic violence. At the risk of being politically incorrect, I think we have to say that the movement against domestic violence is a movement by women and for women. That it was women recognizing women's problems, women working to support other women, Without feminism and feminists, there would be no shelter movement. There would be no shelters for women. Domestic violence work is feminist work. Feminist theory identified and defined the problem of battered women. Feminist activists created the shelters. Feminist principles guide the structure and the orientation of shelter work. The roots of the battered women's movement are found in radical feminist theory. It was radical feminists like Shulmos Firestone, Adrian Rich, Juliet Mitchell, and others that focused our attention on violence against women as a mechanism for the perpetuation of patriarchy. They argued that male violence against women was a strong force in maintaining men's control over women's lives, over social institutions, over women's bodies and their labor. They challenged the ideals of family and revealed family structures to be structures of patriarchy. Radical activist feminists took these messages to heart. Stop violence against women and take back the night coalitions were some of the first results. These coalitions focused on rape, one form of violence against women. Activists created self-defense courses, rape hotlines, marches to take back the night, support groups, all in the interest of supporting women against violence from men. Radical feminists were committed to working with women to empower themselves. By the 1970s, a new focus emerged battered women. Whenever women's groups were formed or hotlines begun, women would call for advice, for protection, but not from rapists lurking in the bushes, but from their partners. Feminists began searching for solutions. I'd like to share a little bit of my own experience in feminist, as a feminist searching for solutions. In Lansing, Michigan, let me see, it was, in the, it was in the early 70s, I was an undergraduate, I went to a self-defense course offered by a group of these feminists. Jan was the instructor. Through Jan, so it was teaching women to resist in terms of rape self-defense. 
through this group that started these self-defense groups, I learned that they were doing other things in the community for women as well. Now, they, they labeled themselves, Kathy talked about different labels, they labeled themselves as separatist, feminist separatist. What this meant is, what meant many things to them, different things, but by and large, it meant to this group that they didn't want to work through traditional channels. They felt that they wanted to work creating things for women, that to work through the ch traditional channels was counterproductive. They wanted to work as women, for women, for women's issues. The group had recognized the need for a safe place for battered women. After their attempts to um, get funding and support for this through traditional channels had failed, they created a system of safe houses for the battered women they came into contact with. It was kind of an underground railroad for battered women, and that's what it was. There was the hotline number, you know, that you used to stand on the street corners with the hat to collect money to pay the bill. Okay, so there was a hotline number, that the number was scratched on restroom walls for women to call, and we got some matchbooks printed up, you know, that you could distribute and leave about so women could call the number. A woman would call the number. She'd be given a second number to call. Arrangements would be made to pick her up in some public place. She and her children would be through, taken through several car switches. You know, it was like Dukes of Hazard or some other kind of show. But you had to do it to a safe house. To a safe house. Usually somebody's spare bedroom. Obviously, the system had some drawbacks, including the safety of those at safe houses. But it was something. While politicians argued about the sanctity of family and rights to privacy, radical feminists were putting their own lives at risk, working to help women protect themselves. Those of you who work at shelters knows how hard, know how hard it is to keep the privacy, the secrecy of where a shelter is. You can imagine having safe houses all the community, how many men showed up at the safe houses as well, which was a continual problem. But it was only through the continued hard work of radical feminists that shelters came into existence. In East Lansing, we had the case of Francine Hughes that was a big push toward helping us get our shelter. I don't know how many of you know of that story. It was made into a movie with um, Farrah Fawcett, The Burning Bed, the book. Okay. Francine had been in safe houses numerous times. That she had um, left her husband, who was a batterer, would go to a safe house, came out. She even had divorced her husband. But through the urging of her family, um, when he was involved in an auto accident, she took him back to nurse him back. And as soon as he regained her strength, he began beating her again. Francine was tried for murder. She had set fire to her husband's, to her drunken husband's bed while he was sleeping after he had beaten her and burned her school books, she felt, for one last time. Radical feminists rallied around Francine Hughes. They worked at her trial. We provided whatever Francine needed, ranging from clothing to wear to court, to a minister that got permission to bring her kids for a visit, to a team of um, legal researchers that supported her court-appointed attorney. Andreas Gridanis. Francine was found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity, a predecessor kind of of the battered women's defense. But when you read the book or see the movie, you don't see those radical feminists. It's Francine Hughes and her great male attorney against the world. Okay, and that's how it was presented. The recognition of their acts and their accomplishments was co-opted from feminist again and again, in this case very clearly. However, publicity from her case brought widespread outrage and support. A shelter funded by volunteer donations was opened shortly thereafter. The story was repeated around the country over and over again. 
that radical feminists were successful in creating shelters, yet very seldom got the recognition for their actions. Most of you probably know in 1975, now created a task force for domestic violence was at the m meeting of this task force in what Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence was created, Feminist Working for Women. By 1979, more than 250 shelters had been opened in the United States. Beyond shelters, feminists pushed for legislation to generate public funding, and to operationalize definitions of, of domestic violence to support women in their activities. Contributions of feminists to the shelter movement go further. The very philosophies and organizations of most shelter structure come from feminist ideals. Rather than the professional model of segmented service provision with a hierarchy and a break between clients and staff, Shelter goals were created to provide an atmosphere of empowerment for women, a place for a woman to heal, to gain strength, to begin to value herself, to establish a basis to reclaim her life. Shelters were there to provide an atmosphere of solace, support, and strength for women to renew their confidence in themselves. As such, the very goals and organizations of, them, of shelters embody feminist principles. What has been accomplished in the movement against domestic violence has been accomplished by feminists. The struggle continues. In the shelter movement, money, so your time doesn't have to be spent writing grants, can be spent working with people, secure funding, the definition. Is this a women's issue? Is it result of patriarchy or a problem? Or is it just something that happens in family? Like what about battered men? and prevention, stopping violence before it starts. And beyond, beyond domestic violence, women's issues, daycare, living wages for women in pink collared jobs, much more. I would argue these things are only going to be done if we, as women of this country, insist upon it. If we, women of this community, do it. I would argue that history has shown us that we need to assist us to organize us in this journey is the reclaiming, the reemergence of the feminist movement. We need to take back our accomplishments, to take back our claim, to take back our name. Women for women, feminists. Thank you. I think you can see why I'm so proud of my colleagues. Um, both Dr. Macheski and Dr. Badira would now like to engage you in a discussion. Um, I'll start and ask if there are any questions from the audience. Remember, this part is yours. The last word is yours. We need your sharing about activism and experience uh, as much as we appreciate your listening to us. Anyone have a question? Yes, Pat. What do we know about uh, the alignment of our current congressional representatives with regard to feminism or any regard to women? The question is, I'll repeat it for everyone, what do we know about our current legislators and their lineup on feminist issues and issues concerning battered women? I'd ask our speakers to come to the microphone, please. Well, it is a complicated answer. Um, we do know and have identified some very supportive legislators on women's issues. 
uh, especially uh, around the issue of uh, domestic violence. We do uh, also know many that are not supportive, but for other reasons, they'll go along with some of the uh, some of their friends and support, but their philosophy may not within themselves isn't supportive. If that makes sense, we've got at this point some very good allies. The governor himself is interested in this issue and is gathering information on domestic violence. The lieutenant governor has long been supportive of domestic violence issues. Those of you that were here yesterday and heard our new attorney general speak, spoke out on his stand uh, and about it being a priority for him, the domestic violence issues. I think um, that it's not so much that they see it as a feminist issue as they see it as a popular issue right now. Uh, and there's a lot of um, information out there and awareness about domestic violence. And there's a lot of information about the effects that domestic violence has on children. And if it's presented in that kind of way, even the most non-supportive legislator can't very well say, well, uh, you know, I think you're, I think it's okay. Uh, because it's not, that would not be a popular stand to talk about um, when you talk about the children raised in those homes and how very damaging domestic violence is for them. So I, it's, a, it's kind of like you have to look at who your legislator is and his philosophy and where he is and choose something that works with him, uh, if that makes sense to people. Uh, but we have a lot of um, support right now. We have some strong women legislators that are very helpful. We have a commission on family violence that's made up of a, a group of uh, strong people in the, com in the state that's supportive of, of the legal issues. Um, so I think the work that's been done with the legislators from way long ago when we first got money for shelter programs has, has built and built to this point. And Advocates are a lot more likely now and very strongly um, identify the issues to their legislators and, are, are not, and we're not um, uh, hesitant, as I kind of am like this right now, off the cuff, <laughs> uh, to talk to the legislators either in person or on the phone and we invite them into our shelters and get them to see what we're doing, which is a very powerful way to get their support. So I don't know when I'm talking about, fem when you're talking about the feminist issues, I'm not, I don't think that many of them actually embrace the feminist issues as such, although we know that's what domestic violence sheltering is about, but they look at it more as I think um, human issues and children and those kinds of things. We also have looked at that and we have that same concern that also the um, movement on fathers or parents too, uh, we feel can be very dangerous to women particularly and, and for us in the battered women's movement, particularly battered women. Uh, but at the same time, that it, we do recognize that's a big movement and it's real popular right now. But when you, you have to look underneath all of that 
to see that the roots are very, very much still patriarchal and that are not based on equality, not based on the belief that women are equal partners, but based on the belief that a man, you know, ought to be a kind patriarch instead of a, a, a bully. Um, and, and it is, I think, a way to kind of um, sidestep the basic issue because they don't talk about domestic violence and they don't talk about equality and they don't talk about sharing uh, decisions. They talk about the man uh, still, you know, making the decisions but doing it in a kinder, gentler way, which still uh, is the superiority kind of thing. In the shelter program, if you have any male volunteers, maybe you'd want to raise your hand. Some of you. I know some of the programs especially use male volunteers in working with the children. I know some use um, male-female team when working with batterers intervention programs. I know that within our shelter in Dalton, we use males in specific ways and we especially try to um, have a mentoring program with boys and males one-on-one -on -one so they can look at some of that um, positive behavior. Uh, but as far as having male volunteers to come in and work directly with battered women, we don't do that. Uh, does anybody have males that come in and work directly with battered women? Some, some shelters have staff that are males. Male interns that come in. Is there another question from the audience? Yes. I don't have another question. Don't go. Today. Don't go. In line with the first question about legislation, I'm also involved with the American Association of University of Women uh, on the state level and the national level. And our organization, prior to each political award, interested in wanting to know where your political officers are and where they stand on the women issue. Are there other questions for our speakers? I, I found a common thread here that I'd like each of our excellent presenters to comment on if they would in closing. Um, we've heard from the practitioners that men, male legislatures, uh, le legislators take it better if they feel that they are still in some kind of moral authority. If in fact the things and activities that they undertake on behalf of women and children are done not with any sort of seeding of power or recognition of equality, but on the sort of moral grounds on which Kathy established that women were eventually given the vote. I also find uh, Ginger's point really well taken that we don't get down to discussing the feminist struggle or naming, in fact, uh, the feminists who have started, you know, the various movements for change in the areas of domestic violence and child care and equal pay and things of that nature. Um, perhaps that's okay, in a sense. Um, as women, if we can help each other, that is the extension of that ethic of care notion. So would each of you like to address that? I mean, how angry should it make us? <laughs> as feminists that we do ourselves out of the public headlines, so to speak. What do you think, each of you? I mean, do we care about that? I think we do. I'm not real sure what, what you're asking, except that... Um, well, do we want the recognition or the change? Oh, well, obviously, we'd like both, but we'll, <laughs> we really want the change, um, obviously we, we do, but it is still, um, I, I don't know, something uh, set off in me when you, you, you mentioned um, uh, anger, how angry should it make us, yeah. and um, we're allowed anger. Uh, the, and, and I really wasn't able to own and claim my anger until I heard a, um, <clears throat> a feminist clergy woman tell me from the pulpit that it's okay to be angry. It's in fact actually good to be angry at times. And so um, I think that it should 
the kinds of things that we're talking about should make us very angry, um, depending on where we are as to how we manifest that anger. But um, whatever um, it takes um, it is, is, is basically um, I, not really the bottom line. I'm not, I'm not a Machiavellian. Yes? I haven't really said anything worth hearing. <laughs> so it's, it's OK. It, we should be angry. <laughs> Um, it's all right to be angry. <laughs> it may be all right to be angry, but I don't know how effective it is. Okay, you know, that I think for me it shows the need for continuous support of women where we can be angry together and then turn our attention outward where we can be more effective without that name. However, I do believe that there, there's value in normalizing feminists, in, 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 claim, in reclaiming the name, in not letting other people do that definition. That um, to, to speak the word and have it associated with your person, but by your actions, by your connection to people, make that okay. okay? Not to hide it away and say, well, you know, over there are those feminists, but to speak in their terms, but to label yourself, to label yourself. So feminist becomes something different. Feminist becomes what it is to people, not what it's been labeled as being. I think that's very important. It means then we don't have to fight the same battles over and over again to get legitimacy. We get legitimacy by who we are and what we have done. So I think that's very important for future change as well. Um, when, you, when you asked how many uh, people in this room would own up to being a feminist, did, did, how many of you raised your hands? I, I'm, oh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, I always poll. of the quarter or the semester, they, they no longer are afraid of the term and they claim, even men claim for themselves uh, the, the word and they claim uh, being feminist. So, yes. by the term gender and I, I mean I don't have anything wrong with gender but it, it's and, and and it's in my title of my dissertation because it was it was less explosive but it, it's it that that's just a mask and and you're right until we um, uh, until we can <clears throat> call it what it is um, it, it's it, it's going to be to some extent neutralized <clears throat> Would any member of the audience like the last word? Remember, it's yours, I promised. Well, I'd like to thank our presenters, and I'd like to offer you a 15-minute break. At 25 until 11, we'll start. Zoom your seats. We have to get smarter about Gloria Steinem before she arrives in a few minutes. The panel presents a retrospective on the life and work of Gloria Steinem who is now unbelievably doing 60 and a little bit more. Uh, we'll all be envious, I'm sure, um, when we see her. The next panel consists of Helen Wishart, who is a graduate student in the Department of English. I said that each person today had a celebration. In the case of Helen, it's a double celebration. She survived her first year of graduate school, did very well indeed gave four academic papers during that year, and also created the wonderful logo 
dream catching for women's studies, which you see in front of you. Any one of you who's purchased that poster or, or the note cards and would like something autographed, uh, Helen is here today and would be more than, more than willing to do so. If you've already got a poster, we can trade you for another one or whatever seems appropriate. Uh, our second speaker is Sue Seiferth from the Department of English. Helen, by the way, will be doing the background information on the life and activism of Gloria Steinem. And Sue will talk about Gloria as a literary persona. And Sue is in the Department of English, and her celebration is that she has been both promoted and tenured in the last two years. I can't remember in what order, but those are all wonderful life events uh, which all women celebrate. The third speaker will be Faye Edwards of our English department, in fact, in the journalism stream, who will look at Steinem's relationship to print journalism. And her celebration is that she gets to go away for a couple of years to the University of Illinois at Urbana, where she will be completing her PhD. So that, too, is something to celebrate. With no further ado, Helen Wishart on the life and activism of Gloria Steinem. Again, you will get the last word. I'm really nervous. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about what Gloria Steinem is doing currently. She is a feminist, and all those things that Ginger Chesky talked about that feminists represent, Gloria Steinem is very much involved in doing. But I do want to give some biographical information so that you can see where she comes from and why she became the committed feminist that she is. Gloria Steinem was born in Toledo, Ohio in 1934 to an unusual middle-class family that, like many others, had fallen on hard times. Her father was a charming, unconventional, heavy-set man, 300 pounds, who never put down roots. He spent his winters traveling through the southern states in a trailer home with his wife and his two daughters, and his summers at a resort he was attempting to develop on the shores of Lake Michigan. They had lived well before Gloria was born, but the family's fortunes fell during, due to the Depression and also to her, due to her father's financial irresponsibility. Her mother, Ruth, who had once had a flourishing career as a journalist and had attempted to maintain it after her marriage until 1929, was driven to despair and several nervous breakdowns by her anxiety over the family's precarious financial affairs. Following the divorce of her parents when she was 10 years old, Gloria found herself living in a basement room behind the furnace of a rat-infested boarding house in East Toledo as the sole caretaker of her mother, who by this time was displaying all the symptoms of what was later diagnosed as severe anxiety neurosis. She continued in that mothering role until she was 17, when her older sister and father intervened in the care of her mother to give her a year to finish high school without this unreasonably heavy responsibility. Facing the hardships she had endured on behalf of Ms. Magazine, Steinem was also able, and these are her words, to recall hardships from her childhood that had been forgotten, looking for dirt tracks on her arms to know if it was time to heat water on the stove for a bath, washing a blouse for school each morning and then ironing it dry, seeing her mother lying helpless on a bed, talking to demons in an unseen world, repeated nightmares of boys taunting her mother mercilessly, fearing that her mother, forgetting that Gloria had told her where she was going, would report her missing to the police, or wander unclothed into the street in search of her mother. From her years in this working class neighborhood, she learned some hard lessons. Although she was well aware of her own attractiveness, she also knew that women living in the grim circumstances of these kinds of mill towns often ended up pregnant, locked into a cycle of self-deprecation, poverty, 
and abuse. For many years, she was troubled by fears of falling into such a regrettable pattern, a fear which she has now overcome. In her essay, Doing 60, she says, I used to pass urban slums or rows of poor houses anywhere and compulsively imagine myself living there. What would it be like? It was a question of such fearsome childhood power that I only recently realized it had fallen away. It's simply gone. Like other such desperate women, she had fantasies of rescue. But these did not revolve around a Prince Charming who would sweep in to take her away from all this. Rather, her dramas focused on her own actions in the world. She was the agent, the rescue ranger, making a better life for herself and those around her. From this time came her strong commitment to social justice and to racial and gender equality. These early experiences and the irresponsibility of her charming father, whom she loved dearly, but who was often absent on his own adventures, indelibly marked her views of marriage, an institution she sees as constraining women's life choices. She calls it a death trap for women, and one which she has assiduously avoided, although she has had satisfying sexual relationships and friendships with many charming men. Watching her mother give up a successful, personally fulfilling career for the sake of her husband's pipe dreams and then being driven into madness by her worries over lack of money, convinced Gloria that childbearing and self-sacrifice were not an essential part of a woman's experience. She has formed instead a self-chosen family of diverse friends of all ages, races, and occupations, and does not feel that she has been cheated or deprived of any close relationships because she has chosen an unconventional lifestyle. Again, in her own words in, from the essay, Doing 60, the deep groove worn by such imaginings, and this is the imaginings of living in um, absolute poverty, has finally been filled by years of words written and deeds done. Crises survived. Friends who became family, work done for others, and thus an interdependence. In other words, I no longer fear ending up where I began. The fortuitous sale of some family property allowed her to go to Smith, one of the seven sister colleges, where for four years she found the peace and security to pursue her own intellectual interests. After a traditional conservative education of the sort also received by fellow Smith alumni such as Nancy Reagan and Barbara Bush, an education appropriate to the consorts of the male movers and shakers of America. She graduated in 1956 and proceeded to take up a fellowship in India in order to escape from her family, her background, and her first serious romantic entanglement, which had necessitated a stopover in Britain for a legal abortion. This personal episode sensitized her to the plight of Indian and other women with no access to safe birth control. In her mind, lack of reproductive freedom was equated with sexual slavery. During her two years in India, she assimilated easily into native dress and living habits while traveling from village to village educating women. India was a pivotal experience for Steinem. The teachings of Gandhi have influenced her her whole life as she learned in her own words, to find out the better side of human nature and to enter people's hearts. Her experiences in India honed her individuality and taught her that she could be self-sufficient through her writing and advocacy. She therefore threw herself into social and political reform once she had reintegrated into the overdeveloped consumerism, as she calls it, of the United States. She spent the next 10 years establishing her credentials in the highly competitive and male-dominated world of journalism. After a series of somewhat frivolous articles concerning fashion and celebrities for magazines such as the Ladies' Home Journal, Glamour, Vogue, and Esquire, 
By the late 60s, she became part of the editorial staff of the newly formed New York Magazine, where she was at last able to write about the social and political issues that concerned her such as the struggles of the migrant farm workers organized by Cesar Chavez and the futility and immorality of the Vietnam War. Steinem's recognition of her feminism came as a result of her coverage of a meeting on abortion law reform in New York City. I would like to read you her actual, uh, an excerpt from her actual column on this. This was March 10, 1969, in her City Politic column. The item reads, Policemen resorted to the rather feminine tactic of hair pulling today in order to get a group of very vocal women out of a meeting on abortion law reform. The women, mostly under 30, disrupted the meeting in fine style, wanting to know why there was only one woman called to testify. This is 15 men were there and one woman and she was a nun. <laughs> and why the abortion laws weren't just repealed instead of compromising on reforms. Florence Kennedy, now this Florence Kennedy, a lawyer and black militant, later became one of Gloria Steinem's speaking partners when she went out on the road to promote feminism. Florence Kennedy, a lawyer and black militant at whose name strong white men shake, went into her specialty, creating a newsworthy sideshow to call attention to a good cause. Listen, she said cheerfully, why don't we shoot a New York state legislator for every woman who dies from an abortion? Now this, um, this particular meeting ended up with, uh, well it was, ended up with police pulling women's hair. <laughs> But a month later, a radical feminist called the Red Stockings in New York organized another meeting on this, and it was a speak out on abortion. Now, you remember that on her way to India, Gloria Steinem had had a legal abortion, which she undertook with a great deal of soul searching, but this was now the beginning of her life, and she did not believe that she was capable of having a child. But she had never told anyone and that would have been uh, probably 12, 13 years previously. So this was her own personal history coming into collision with feminism. This is the, her comments um, on her listening to the speak out on abortion that was organized by the Red Stockings. Suddenly I was no longer learning intellectually what was wrong, I knew. Why should each of us who had had an abortion be made to feel criminal and alone? Steinem has described her feelings at the abortion speak out as the great blinding light bulb that suddenly illuminated a previously dark room. Women spoke personally. They trusted those hearing them. All the humiliations of being a woman, from political assignments lost to less experienced male writers to a lifetime of journalist jokes about frigid wives, dumb blondes, and farmers' daughters that I had smiled at in order to be one of the boys, suddenly sharpened into focus, their meaning revealed. This was the aha, the epiphanic experience when Gloria Steinem became a feminist. From that moment on, she no longer worked on the political campaigns of men. Her focus has been on women's issues. Ms. Magazine was one attempt at providing an exclusive forum for women's concerns. Her other efforts include traveling constantly and giving unstintingly of her time to help women organize around shelters for battered women, daycare centers, dissemination of birth control information, and equality in the workplace. From the beginning, she realized that her constituency could not be only white, middle-class women, but all women, regardless of ethnicity, socioeconomic status, race, or sexual orientation. Her greatest gift has been her ability to act as a moderator of sharply divergent views and political agendas. Her gift as a moderator and peacemaker is because she has an incredible ability to stay calm and focused. I had the privilege of hearing her in Toronto in the fall of 1992 and was immediately struck by her gentle demeanor and the logic of her presentation. 
She had just spent some years in therapy, revisiting her own personal traumas, as described in her book, The Revolution from Within. Most significant was her willingness to share her own pain and vulnerability as a means of empowering other women whose life circumstances had shattered their self-esteem. She spoke passionately of the need to value and care for ourselves in order to have a solid foundation from which to change the world. In spite of what appeared to be privileged existence, by the time she'd reached her 50s, she had burned out from the sheer volume of her commitments and her bout with breast cancer and chemotherapy. Although her commitment to social justice is as passionate as ever, she has had to learn to live not in the past nor constantly in the future, but to enjoy the present moment. I would like to conclude with her own thoughts on doing 60. This is her latest book, Moving Beyond Words, and the essay that I'm referring to is the last one. I heartily recommend it. How we speak to each other, how our bodies feel, what we wear, how we work, what we buy, what we eat, whom we love, all these are part of the impact of our lives. Indeed, I'm not sure we have any idea which of our actions is important while we are doing it. Therefore, to get us out of any sober, historic, or otherwise intimidating mood, I'll risk placing a poem here. Nothing is accomplished without making fools of ourselves, and poetry for me is like singing in the shower. I well understood while writing it that groups of women mentioned here might have little choice as to how they dressed or acted, but this poem refused to be politically correct. Even its title is only the answer that popped out when someone asked me what I planned for my old age. The name of the poem? I hope to be an old woman who dresses very inappropriately. <laughs> and here it is. Women in business dress in man-style suits and treat their secretaries in a man-style way. Women on campus wear masculine thoughts and look to daddy for good grades. Married women give their bodies away and wear their husband's wishes. Religious women cover sinful bodies and ask redemption from God, not knowing she is within them. That is why I'll always love the fat woman who dares to wear a red miniskirt, because she loves her woman's body. The smart woman who doesn't go to college and keeps possession of her mind. The lover who remains a mistress because she knows the price of marrying. The witch who walks naked and demands to be safe. The crazy woman who dyes her hair purple, because anyone who doesn't love purple is crazy. Dear Goddess, I pray for the courage to walk naked at any age, to wear red and purple, to be unladylike, inappropriate, scandalous, and incorrect to the very end. And her comment, as you can see, I'm just beginning to realize the upcoming pleasures of being a Nothing to lose, take no shit, older woman. <laughs> of looking at what once seemed outer limits as just road signs. I'm going to begin this morning with um, a digression, and I think that Gloria Steinem might approve of this. Um, I think I came to feminism just through common sense, so it didn't seem so radical to me. I began uh, my college education as a 32-year-old single mother. Surprise? <laughs> Sounds familiar to some of you, I'm sure. I graduated uh, with a bachelor's degree from an institution about twice the size of Valdosta State University. In the English department, there was one female faculty member. I thought this wasn't right. 
I thought it wasn't even more right when I found out a little bit about the history of this woman. She was the first woman to graduate with a PhD from Vanderbilt University's English department. She became semi-famous for discovering something about John Crow Ransom's poetry that he didn't know himself and agreed was correct. She was never awarded tenure at, at uh, Middle Tennessee State University where she spent her entire academic career as a, as a professor. Her husband was the chair of the department. I knew there was something wrong. It made sense to me to continue my education as I was trying to support my children. I went to the University of Iowa where I received my PhD. I had no female teachers ever while I got my, was working on my PhD. So all of this made sense to me. Um, I now have tenure in the English department here and it makes perfect sense to me. I ought to. <laughs> and so should Dr. Virginia Peck ought to have had uh, tenure uh, when I was an undergraduate studying with her. My task is a happy one this morning to talk about literary aspects of Gloria Steinem's work. And it occurs to me that some of us might be wondering what literary aspects are. Sometimes I wonder myself. Most of us really know what literary aspects are uh, when we're reading. We just may not have the words to talk about them, but we know the ideas and that's important. We've heard of things like plot, character, setting, all of us know that. But of course, for those of us who make literature our work, we have to have an esoteric way of speaking about these so we sound like we know more than everybody else does. All disciplines have such jargon. For those whose work is literature, uh, some of those words are, or phrases are sentence structure, that means are they long or short, <laughs> image, that's a picture, motif, a recurrence, Parody, making fun of not a subject but a style, and on and on and on. And so when I talk about Gloria Steinem and the literary aspects in her work, some of these words will appear, but I hope that I've sanitized this and cleaned it up of all this jargon. First of all, I think we recognize Gloria Steinem as a writer who is an innovator. And I say this because she herself balks at attempts to categorize her writing, and I like that very much in her. She delights in writing as a creative act, and she says this in the preface of her Moving Beyond Words, which Helen uh, read from previously, the 1994 collection. I like to, um, one critic called this in an attempt to categorize it an adventure of essays. Steinem herself, uh, in her preface, says this about it. Each of these six parts is rather like, notice how tentative she is, is rather like a condensed book. Since there seems to be no genre, fiction, poetry, essay, for this work, I found myself explaining it this way, tentative again, if, if you added water to any of the, these parts, it would become a book. So Steinem here is conscious of genre. An essay, for example, she's been categorized here as the writer of an adventure of essays. An essay is defined often as an attempt or a try, so it is tentative. It is never considered to be an exhaustive statement on a subject. That's why she writes in the preface with more tentative words like rather like, seems instead of is, and a word like if, hypothetically, maybe. The fact that the essay is non-exhaustive also works well with her statement that if you added water to any of the parts, it would become a book because it lets us know that there might be more to say, and then again, there might not be more to say. Steinem is also conscious of strategy, style. For example, she writes an essay in uh, Moving Beyond Words called What If Freud Were Phyllis? It is a parody. And a parody makes fun of a particular style of writing rather than the subject, but 
Uh, what Steinem does here is wed parody to burlesque. Now I said parody makes fun of style, burlesque makes fun of subject. I'm going to, I need these now. Okay. This, this is a very interesting, we'll call it essay, a try, an attempt, uh, in its structure. It's put together with a number of footnotes, and that's what the parody is, a parody of the academic style, the way people like I am supposed to write in order to get tenure. Okay, uh, Half the page is the text of the essay, and usually at least half the page is uh, footnotes. So she's making fun of this, uh, what we call academic apparatus here. But listen to the way she phrases her footnotes. I'm reading the first one to you. Good. You're looking down here. <laughs> so she's very conscious of her readers, isn't she? You'll need the habit, and you'll see why. This is all parenthetical. Now comes the academic stuff. The Equal Rights Amendment would make discrimination based on sex as unconstitutional as that based on race, religion, or national origin. Its exact words are, oh great, it's a quotation. Equality of rights under the law shall not be abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Here comes the other voice. Radical, huh? <laughs> So she's not only, as I say, mocking style here, but she's also mocking um, the subject matter, and that is the, uh, the very academic approach here. As I said, the footnotes can be read as a text of their own, and because Steinem instructs us in how to read the text, read it text, then footnotes, or try to read text and go down and read the footnote every time there is an asterisk. Uh, that she's very aware of, of her readers and places a great deal of responsibility, but also the responsibility of choice on us as readers. She mocks her subject, which is psychoanalysis and the cult of Freud in this essay, and she incorporates one of my favorites, if not my favorite literary aspect into it, as you can see, humor, uh, by using irony and um, surprise. I'd like to read uh, the last um, paragraph and last footnote from this um, particular essay on Freud. She says, it will be difficult to keep Freud and Freudianism alive and powerful, but we have advantages. Phyllis Freud never made the fatal error of Karla Marx, whose interest in historical events created public measures by which her theory could be said to succeed or fail. Marx lost the protean quality of myth, which reinforces changeless beliefs in a changing world. Freud retained it. Her theory keeps society and the psyche in its proper order. There is no reason why this deep purpose shouldn't continue to be served. Here's the footnote, too. There is no reason why this deep purpose shouldn't continue to be served. And it will, if we let it. <laughs> I think that final footnote to her essay on Phyllis Freud uh, uh, reflects the literary uh, aspect of sentence structure, short this time, and also uh, uh, implies a great deal of activism, which is a quality of her work, and that is the implication is after, and it will if we let it, don't let it. Motif is another word we use when we talk about um, literary aspects. As I said earlier, this is a recurrence. It could be a character, an idea, a way of, of phrasing. One of the motifs that we see in uh, this particular book, Moving Beyond Words, I think, is strength. Uh, as I said, she uses humor in the, Freud as in the Freud essay, which strengthens its appeal, I think. But in her essay called The World's Strongest Woman, a biography of Bev Francis, she uses strength in a very literal sense through bodybuilding, and she incorporates the language of the bodybuilder into this uh, biography. For example, she describes the appearance of Bev Francis after a particularly rigorous um, uh, several months of training as looking ripped, R-I-P-P-E-D, which is a bodybuilder's phrase for absolutely no fat between the skin and the muscle. So no fat, only muscle. 
Another motif in, in uh, uh, this particular essay and throughout the book is, of course, revolution. Particular uh, revolt that she stages in the essay about Bev Francis is against something that she calls being chosen. Let me read a little bit to you from uh, The Politics of Muscle, The World's Strongest Woman. She begins this essay by talking about being a woman who grew up in a time when we weren't encouraged to participate in sports. Uh, there were things like cheerleaders and something she calls strutters, what some of us might call pom-pom girls, that were very athletically inclined, but rather than being rewarded for their athleticism, that it was some, simply a procedure of being chosen. Uh, she says, but even winning one of those rare positions of cheerleader or strutter, the stuff that dreams were made of was more about body display than about the considerable skill they required. You could forget about trying out for them if you didn't have the right face and figure. And my high school was full of girls who had learned to do backflips and twirl flaming batons all to no avail. Winning wasn't about being the best in an objective competition or achieving a personal best or even about becoming healthy or fit. It was about being chosen. And in fact, this essay ends up being about Bev Francis, a woman who thought winning was being about her personal best and about uh, c competing in an objective competition who was simply was not chosen uh, for many reasons. We have one more passage um, from this one. My sports avoidance continued into college. This is Steinem again, not Bev Francis, where I went through shock about class and wrongly assumed athletics were only for well-to-do prep school girls like those who brought their own lacrosse sticks and riding horses to school with no sports training to carry over from childhood and no place to become childlike, as we must when we belatedly learn basic skills, I clung to my familiar limits. Even at the casual softball games where Ms. played the staffs of other magazines, I confined myself to cheering. As the Ms. No Stars, we prided ourselves on keeping the same lineup, win or lose, and otherwise disobeying the rules of the jockocracy. So I contented myself with upsetting the men on the opposing team by cheering for their female team members. It's amazing how upset those accustomed to conventional divisions can become when others refuse to be divided by them. The rest of this essay could be described as one that is structured around what my students like to call comparison and contrast. Comparison is both similarity and dissimilarity, where Steinem uh, compares her own experiences or lack of exposure to um, objective competition in, an, in the athletic um, events with Bev Francis, who never won a, a top weightlifting or bodybuilding uh, title in this country and is the strongest woman, remains the strongest woman in the world. She, in fact, is stronger uh, per pound than Arnold Schwarzenegger is, and she's a little bitty woman. Steinem is also, I think, characterized by an authentic voice. And when we say voice and refer it uh, to a literary aspect, we simply mean what you hear, what kind of person do we hear when we're reading something. And we certainly hear an authentic voice in uh, most of her work, particularly uh, I like to um, look at Doing 60, the uh, uh, essay that contains the poem that Helen Ray read. It's on Steinem's Approaching 60. Uh, she, in, in this essay, as in many others, is not afraid to let her readers see her revise her writing, which is a very brave stance for a writer to take. Let me uh, read you the last paragraph of, of uh, Doing 60. I was about to end with this. There's no second like the next one. That's what she was to end with. In much the same spir spirit that I ended the preface of this book, when she said, I can't wait to see what happens, which remains true. But, and here's the revisionary word here, but this new state of mind would have none of it, and she ends it with, there's no second like this one. So Steinem ends, actually, with the beginning, 
which is another interesting aspect of her um, literary approach, to conclude with a, a, actually a beginning. I hope that um, you will read Gloria Steinem if you haven't, and if you have, I hope you'll read more. Certainly, our doing, moving beyond words, is a good place to start, also a good place to continue. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Um, it is a delightful for me to be here, and I was a little surprised when asked to participate on this panel because I guess for me, um, my background, since everyone has mentioned something about their own feminism, uh, I had never really thought of myself as a feminist. I al always thought of myself as being different, and I think that's directly related to coming from the African American community and coming from uh, a Southern uh, black preacher's family. And I always say that my childhood was um, full of irony and opposites in the sense that because of the social condition, we were taught that you should strive and be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. But on the other hand, as a, as a Baptist preacher's daughter, you couldn't wear pants uh, every day. So um, I can say that most of my life has been a little uh, confused, maybe, or uh, a little different. And I think that, that those are the things that lead people into the area of journalism. <laughs> I always tell my students that in order to be a good journalist, you must be a little crazy and very, very nosy. And I'd also, before I get into the, the points I'd like to make about Steinem in the press, um, there was a question asked earlier in the session uh, by uh, Dr. Sodi as to whether or not we should claim our feminism and whether we should be angry and how can we then um, let our accomplishments be known. And I was chomping at the bit and I say that yes, we should be angry and we should seek the recognition but the way that women must do this, as well as other minorities, is through the press. And that is the way that we must do it. We must learn to manipulate it. We must learn how it works. And we must infiltrate it uh, in every aspect. Now, my encounters with Gloria Steinem and her use of the press and her criticism of mass media have stemmed from courses I've taught my students uh, in the sense that I'm a journalist who teach composi teaches composition, I had to find ways to make it interesting to them and to me. And one of the ways um, I've done this is by making one of our composition courses a media criticism course. And in that course, we've encountered several essays by Gloria Steinem that have led to some very, very significant discussions and papers on the press in America, how it works, and how we can participate in it. But just to start, let me give you some background about um, attitudes about the media and attitudes about the press in the United States. In the 1600s, when this uh, country was founded, or we had our first colony, the governor of Virginia said that education and the printing press were the sources of the ruination of civilization. The spreading of ideas, especially to the common person, he said, was deemed as a surefire way to destroy social order. Clearly, it is in fact then the idea that information in the hands of the individual might help her to think for herself and to make her own choices. And that, of course, would be the end of civilization. From the very beginning of the technology that made mass communication possible, information has been viewed as power. Every great idea or movement has always been moved forward through the dissemination of information to the masses. 
One of the reasons I studied journalism was because I was fascinated with the people, the reporters, the managers who knew everything and so authoritatively told the world about it every day on the evening news or in the daily paper. When I got a chance to be in the newsrooms and on the quote scene of an event, I began to see the differences between what I observed and what actually happened and what actually ended up in the paper or on the air. Then I began to see and hear people speak with authority about news events, but what they were really repeating was only what they read and heard in the media. I realized how much information the average person was missing out on and how uninformed their decisions were. Once behind the scenes, one realizes that our media consumption must become less passive and more critical. We cannot blindly and mindlessly consume messages that are in fact very deliberately packaged and delivered. Gloria Steinem has in her years of activism recognized this power of the press and she has consistently used her voice to bring to our attention the incomplete and missed messages in the media about women and about other causes and issues. She has also used the power of the press as a journalist to provide information to women and the world that should and does empower them and motivate their own activism. As a media manipulator, Steinem has effectively used the press, press from within and without. They say that in order to understand and use the press, it is, you have to first participate in it. And as we heard uh, from Helen, she has, has had a very connected history with the idea of journalist from, journalism from her mother. And she has, in fact, been able to do that. She was and is a journalist with one of her most influential achievements coming with the founding of Ms. Magazine in 1972. The magazine was, I think, an effort to go beyond the trend in specialized women's magazines of that time. Steinem herself says Ms. Mag Ms. always had a problem with advertisers because it was, quote, the only women's magazine that didn't supply what the ad world euphemistically describes as a supportive editorial atmosphere. <laughs> More specifically, the magazine did not have articles about beauty products, food wonders, fashion trends, and the like. She was fighting more than one battle when it came to practicing journalism in this forum. First of all, she was a woman, and everyone knows that women can't cover real news. Secondly, Steinem wanted to provide real information for women, that is news, uh, everyday, international, local, everything. What was she thinking? After all, women's magazines, according to one journalist, are, quote, just catalogs. They have nothing to do with journalism. Because of Steinem's early experience with journalism, Ms. Magazine tried to do everything differently, and as a result, Steinem learned a tremendous amount of information about the press in America and the constitutional right of the First Amendment. It is, in my opinion, these experiences with the magazine that have made her such a talented and skilled critic of the press, and that's where I think most of her, her value, at least for me and my classes, lie, is in her criticism of the press. Um, let's see. Lost my place. She has, been a, a, she has been able to effectively point out and bring to light the depth of America's problems of sexism and racism through media, which is often the most influential and most pervasive way of getting a message across. In one of her essays used in my class entitled Sex, Lies, and Advertising, Steinem reveals very clearly what Ms. Magazine wanted to do for women, and it revealed the mind and real power behind our so-called free press. In this essay, Steinem begins by recounting a conversation she had at a luncheon with a communist diplomat 
uh, whose country was undergoing some changes and they were freeing up some of the restraints on the press in that country. He asked her, uh, as well as other journalists at the table, that everything, he said everything was going fine in his country, but he wanted to know how he could more subtly control the press. No one at the table answered, everyone was silent. Gloria Steinem offers an answer, very characteristically, and it is one word. She simply says, advertising. Later on, she was attacked by the other journalist who said, how dare you imply that the United States has some limits on freedom of speech and freedom of the press. But as usual, Steinem, in her uh, char characteristically and logical way of arguing, presents more than enough anecdotal evidence to prove her point. In one example, Steinem explains that Clairol, uh, a part of Bristol Myers, refused to advertise in Ms. Magazine because the magazine had a section in which it wrote a brief report on a congressional hearing which concluded that some chemicals and hair dyes were carcinogens. Clairol and Bristol Myers had advertised in Ms. Mag Ms. Magazine um, previously, but they were very angry at Ms. Magazine for that particular report, despite the fact that the same information appeared in several newspapers. And in fact, Bristol Myers discontinued advertising with Ms. Magazine almost until the end, and, or not the end, until its reorganization in 1990. In another case, General Mills, Kraft, Stouffer, and other food companies did not advertise in the magazine primarily because, they told Ms., it did not publish recipes. Despite strong readership data, and they had, Ms. had very good uh, data to support the readership, and uh, when you go to advertisers, of course, that's what they want to know. But despite that, and despite the, the information that Ms. provided, that there were several other publications who uh, did not, which did not publish recipes, um, these particular companies refused to advertise in Ms. Magazine because it was a woman's magazine and it did not feature recipes. Like many other publications, especially with special interest, these things led to continuous financial difficulty with the magazine. In the case of Ms., a buyout in 1987 and 1989 were the results of some of the financial difficulties. Fortunately, despite a suspension in publication in 1990, Ms. is still published, but it is bi-monthly and it is advertising free and totally reader supported. In many other cases, publications that try to be different and try to support specialized views and causes have all fallen by the wayside from lack of advertising. So Steinem's assessment of how to control the press is very accurate. Messing with the press always gets you in trouble, and Steinem messes with the press. She knows how to use it, and she knows how to make her point in it. Most recently, Steinem used, Steinem used her knowledge of the press and her natural ability to make a good argument to bring to light the glamorizing of the hustler publisher Larry Flint in the movie The People vs. Larry Flint. In her opinion piece, which ran in the January 7th New York Times op-ed uh, section, Steinem does what I try to get my students and everyone else I meet to do con who, when we talk about consuming media images. Steinem calls to everyone's attention that media, film in this case, only gives us a part of the story. And it is rolled around, fixed up, and cleaned up to make a dollar. Her article pleads to all of us not to believe what we see. No, she instead says, know that there is much more to the story. Know that the media does not always have your best interest in heart. They want to make money. She so clearly points out that we will miss the real point of information if we do not look deeper. She denounces the film supporters' point that Larry Flint was an advocate and a champion of free speech and the First Amendment. 
She points out that the media, specifically Hollywood, participates in the degradation of women all in the name of free speech and that we all should have some objection to that. Her editorial, as a result, created a flood of criticism and protest of the movie, which some say resulted in the fizzling out of its success and also in a dampering of its recognition at the Academy Awards this year. Finally, I believe through Steinem's savvy with media, she sends a clear message to all of us, especially women. Quote, be critical of everything you, your five senses pick up from any sort of media because there's always more to the story. James Fallow says in his book, Breaking the News, ignoring news leaves people with no way to, with no way to prepare for trends they don't happen to observe themselves. No tools with which to make decisions about public leaders or policies. We need the media, news, and entertainment, but we must be as keen and on point as Steinem when it comes to our consumption. Information is power. We rely almost entirely on media for news about the world. We must, as Steinem says, or and as she does, make our final messages and knowledge of events the result of cross-references questions and a variety of sources, or we should make our final messages from the media what I tell my students is a mosaic. Our final message should be a compilation of many sources. In other words, we cannot believe only what we see on television and what we read. We should dig deeper. As women, we must, I think Steinem says, participate, create, create and critique our own media. We must, as women, create our own messages and our own images. Thank you. Once again, uh, my pride and my colleagues abound. And uh, I would like them to come forward and uh, take your questions. If they can, they'll try. I don't think they know all of the uh, lies and uh, distortions and interesting things about Gloria's life, but I I'm sure if any of you would like to discuss any aspect of her work, uh, they they'd be happy to join in. Are there questions? Yes. I don't I don't know if she's uh, brought any of her books with her. Certainly, we don't have any. Uh, I'm just not certain until Valerie returns. Other questions? Yes, Linda. I have a, a quick comment. Are you Helen, the last speaker? Uh, uh, let me introduce. Faye. This is Faye, Faye. Sue, and Helen. asking you to uh, begin the process of the buffet lunch, those of you who are joining Gloria Steinem, in about 10 minutes. As I understand it um, from Valerie, 
we are supposed to be in place with our food before Gloria enters the room, okay? This is probably to keep down the confusion. So take a 10 minute break and when I ask, please come to the food next door. Thank you.